All right. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about with today's lecture just has to do with where we start with structures in terms of trying to understand the spatial, volumetric, even the aesthetic content of the choices that we make structurally. I want you to consider these slides off to the left here. These are all the exact same footprint. They're oriented as a box with one particular view in one direction. You can see the daylight's supposed to be coming in in the other direction. So all of these are essentially right answers, but they're also kind of wrong answers too, depending on what your priority is. And I'm gonna keep coming back to this theme over and over again. There are lots of different ways to create form, space, volume. We can make structures stand up in many different ways. But this relationship between the intended form, space, and volume is really what we're after. Top one with the two walls to the side, slab across the top. Second one with a whole series of columns, and you can see that's got an aesthetic and structural implication. Opening up the two sides there, meaning that we're doing it with really deep beams. Using walls on the ends, maybe that blocks the view, but it opens up the two sides or you have a sort of college of design scheme there. Over here on the right, you can just see that it's important because how we then make these choices of where the columns are, what these beams are, what the, even the slab looks like, is an overall part of our larger expression. Look, I know a lot of you are probably thinking to yourself, I don't want to make the wrong choice. How do I even start? Do I use columns? Do I use walls? Which direction do I put them in? What's the right answer for this? And so, again, I keep coming back to you. What do you think the right answer is? So here I've drawn five different plans. Each one of these plans is a 60-foot by 120-foot footprint. And they show a variety of ways to locate columns and or walls within these footprints. We can make all of these work structurally. So in other words, they're all right. But the thing is, what if they're all wrong to a certain extent? The spacing of columns, for instance, what if that doesn't comply with where your unit wall is, or it ends up right in the middle of one of your living rooms? Right? Then it was potentially a wrong answer. So all I'm going to come back to here is, for now, these are just incomplete answers. It could be all of those things we just don't know. So when you set up your grid, one of the things that you want to ask yourself is, what's it supposed to correspond to? Look at the drawing on the left here. This shows on one floor, you have a series of units. Maybe these are small units. You see the red is maybe a support wall, the red columns on the outside. So then each one of those supports corresponds with the function and the size of each one of those units. Now that works great if all the units repeat like that, and you can see what happens when we extrapolate this on the right. Stack them all up. Now, of course, if you had a totally different function that needed to be accommodated in there, like a giant airplane, even though that footprint is the same overall width and length, we wouldn't be able to have all those walls that go through because we need to do accommodate a giant airplane. Now, I think you know this intuitively, but it's worthwhile to put these things together in the diagram off to the right. What you see is once we have grids and we start stacking these grids, the forces flow all the way down. When they flow all the way down, maybe it works great with your housing units that those are all stacked up, those loads transfer. When we get down to the, the very bottom here, there's nowhere for those loads to go. We'd have to have a massive, massive type of transfer beam along the lower edge. That lower edge then is going to change the sectional, spatial experiential qualities. Think about then what the choice of the material also means for the aesthetics of what you're trying to do. Structural material, as we know, is the number one determinant of structural behavior. Stiffness, strength, allowable span. And so we can't really separate any of these choices then from a structural choice. Here you're looking at a mass timber project. This is the design building at uh, UM Amherst. Here's a drawing of Arrow Saarinen did for the women's dormitory at Drake University. And you can see the use of the precast there in another dormitory on the right shows you how the building structure, these are in fact meant to be stacked. The walls then are the things that separate acoustically, they separate things spatially, 
And Saarinen's scheme he also then used precast for the floor as well. Keeping it all very thin, very low, but the use of material then is intrinsic to the rest of the scheme. My advice to you, figure out some of that initial stuff that we just talked about, and then solve one bay. Look at this very simple idea. We know that we have load collectors, things that then span horizontally. In this case, it can be a deck, it can be a beam. So all of these load collectors go from one element perpendicular to the other, which spans perpendicular to the other. And eventually then we get to what's called a load grounder. This can be a column, or it can be a wall. And eventually we need load stabilizers. We don't want this bay to tip over, unless we do something special with the connections we know it's not stable yet. So if you solve one bay, here you see the same bay again off to the left. So once we have that bay, which we've already established on the left-hand side, we can take that bay and we can stack it too high. Now, of course, we'd have accumulated vertical loads as we come down, but the thing is, all the horizontals that you're trying to do, your beams, your slab, those values don't change. The only value that changes when we stack it is the amount of stress in the vertical load grounders. You can also then take this bay and repeat it. You can array it to the side. You can make an L shape. And again, with all of these, all you really have to do is to solve the horizontal in one of the bays and then be able to extract this all the way through. There's a regularity to this in an order that's nice in terms of organizational strategy. So, one of your questions might be, well, how far is too far? Or how close is too close when trying to determine the columns or the walls? So look at these two examples here. Both, again, have the same footprint. One of them has a bay that's 20 foot by 40 foot, and one is a 20 foot by 20 foot. I very specifically have not put in any of the unit plans here because I just wanted to start with an abstract idea that we could then vary that based on what your unit plans would be. Mostly what you see here is I've doubled the span in one direction. I hope by now you understand that what happens with that is a sectional and spatial and volumetric consequence. The farther apart the verticals go, the deeper the horizontals between them have to be. In other words, we're changing the span. In this case, you can see that the span is more than double, four times. If you have closer verticals, you have a lot shallower horizontals between them, but now you have more verticals. And so on the top scheme, if I wanted to have no verticals because I needed a wide open view somehow, or functionally, I needed to make sure that you know there was no uh, intermediate columns throughout there. I could use that one. The bottom one is one if I really wanted to emphasize more of the modular pod. As you're going through this, you of course remember that the materials that we use matter, and that one of the other things we have to choose is which way our framing goes. The top ones show a one-way framing, meaning that the load collectors are then running in one direction, pushing their load in that one direction. The bottom ones are two-way framing. In this, of course, you remember the two-way framing is square, usually a square bay. And then that two-way framing means that the loads are pushed either to front and back or side to side. The top one, we see steel and concrete, a composite deck like the King Pavilion. Then the other, other side, we see the precast concrete slabs. It can be an integral flat slab or a plate and beam slab or, this will also look familiar to you, you can do cast in place that is also a one-way framing. So on the top here, you can see with the white arrows, it's showing which way the direction of the loads are going. Bottom is the College of Design waffle slab, the two-way frame in which we have columns on all four sides. Again, please pay attention to the size of the bays in the unit. The top one, look at the distinct rectangular bay size, and the bottom, you see that it's a square. There's also more to it in thinking about this sectionally. You may not want a column at the face of the exterior of your building. You may want to free up the exterior of your building to have a, a thin slab edge. And if you put a gigantic beam along that edge, it may be not what you're after. 
So in this one, all I did was I took that column and I moved it back three or maybe four feet. And to the right, I'm just showing you an example of a mass timber building in which they then extend that girder out and extend the slab out, and it becomes a thinner cantilevered edge. You can see again, this works if you have a cantilever that comes all the way out, and look at then the, the consequences then for the building section as you come to the side. That being said, of course, this puts the column more in your room. This may not be exactly where you want to have a column if you've got a couch, if you've got a bed, or it may be absolutely perfect if you're trying to do a built-in for a shelf, or in this case, it looks like you're intended to walk around the column. It's not just an aesthetic choice. Remember that when we do cantilevers, either a single cantilever or a double cantilever, what's really happening here is we're reducing the amount of maximum moment. When we reduce the maximum moment, you can see from the moment diagram on the left-hand side, we reduce the maximum moment, which means we reduce the amount of bending. And in doing so, you can actually then start to get this really articulated sense of shape and volume within there. Look at the top one on the, on the right. This one starts to articulate maybe where a, a corridor could be, a thin edge out to the side. Or the one on the bottom is if we don't want any columns on the inside. In other words, you maybe want that corridor without any columns in there. Then you just have all the supports on the edge, still have a thin cantilever to the outside. This is where we get into a little bit more interesting categories. It's not just about your vertical supports. We also have to integrate a bracing strategy. So as you're going through this and you have a grid, we have to have a bracing strategy. So the bracing strategy, uh, we're going to go through three different kinds here. One is called a bay and a grid, where Essentially, with the plan down below, you just have an entire bay, and throughout all the bays, you regularly brace it. You can brace that, as you can see here, with X bracing. In the middle, a frame, you use the bay grid scheme, but then you use a rigid frame, moment frame connection. So basically, you're stiffening it everywhere. You could also stiffen the scheme everywhere if you added walls. Now, when you're looking at the bay grid scheme with walls, you see those walls have a spatial consequence to them. They also look pretty familiar in a housing project because they look like walls that you might use for stair or elevator. The idea is that you have a regular system set up with bays, then you come back and figure out whether you want to do it with bracing or frames or walls. You can take another approach to this, which is called casing, and a casing is essentially where all the bracing is on the outside. It doesn't mean that there's not vertical supports on the inside for gravitational support. It just means that what you're asking the outside to do is to provide all the lateral bracing on the outside. Again, on the left, we see X bracing all around the outside. It gives it a distinct sort of diagrid look to it. In the middle, the frame, we have a rigid frame that's on the outside. And on the far right, we're using walls. Look at the spatial consequences and environmental consequences and even the aesthetic consequences between all three of these. Imagine that you live within one of these little bays, looking out through X bracing. We're looking out through something that's uninterrupted with the frame or having a lot of your view closed off by walls. Another common scheme, of course, is just to put all the bracing in a core. That can be a core where you use the X bracing again, where you just have the vertical and horizontals tied together with a moment connection and you make a frame. Or of course you use walls. And the plan of, we're showing here that you could have elevator and stair walls and of course that makes some sense. Think about aesthetically then where those are located, how they're located, what these walls are gonna look like. Obviously there's hybrids to this because it really depends on where you're going to put your stairs or where you're going to put your elevators. They can be in the middle. They can be on the edges. And then when you start to have a stair and elevator that have walls, does that mean that you're going with a casing wall scheme? Or are you going with a core wall scheme? Or are you going with a casing rigid frame scheme? What I want you to settle in when you're looking at this is 
is just the idea that the stair and elevator can be used for both vertical and horizontal load distribution. And with all things, of course, hybrids happen all the time. You can have a casing scheme that has both rigid frame and walls. I want you to think about when you do that, if you're putting walls in or using shear walls, think about what axes these shear walls are in. If you remember from our experiments in 345, we have to make sure that they're in both axes. And so the one on the very bottom, it's showing you that you have shear walls that stabilizes two axes somewhat symmetrically. 